patrons. Welcome to Beyond the Microphone, the behind the scenes bonus content for Mad Max Minute. I am Rick. And I'm Julia. I hope you didn't miss us too much. We had Thanksgiving here in America last week, so we decided to take a week off. So here we are back again. Uh, production wise, we are edited and posted and ready to drop up through episode 32, which is going to drop early to mid-March, so that's nice. We are 14 episodes ahead of release, so that's pretty awesome. We're going to be recording 33 through 35 this weekend, and I am working on lining up guests for 36. Yeah. So last weekend, we recorded with V2A, Mm -hmm. uh, Drone and Mechanized from that group, and it was such a fun recording. Yeah. They were so entertaining and told great stories. I was intimidated because I've seen their work and they're very boisterous Mm -hmm. and very tangenty. So I was nervous. I was very nervous, but it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, People may remember that I've been posting a lot of links to their stuff in the Facebook group because like V2A, they're a good group. They're really fun. They do some really fun things. I'm not necessarily someone that listens to them for their music by any stretch of the imagination, but all of the Wasteland Weekend, post-apocalyptic themed stuff they do is equally fun. And one of those things that is actually starting on December 5th, which is tomorrow, is their Kickstarter for a series of comic books of them being characters in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, they've said it's like Mad Max meets Suicide Squad. And knowing their different personalities from watching them on YouTube when they do their, oh gosh, what are they called? Uh, Freak Show is their little YouTube show where they track down celebrities and drag them onto the show. And (laughs) they've had Dana, they've had Mark, they've had uh, Emil, Minty, come on. Like a lot of the people that we've talked to in the past have also talked to them and then some. So it's pretty great. Um, they, every time I hear them, I always get excited with the idea of Wasteland Weekend type activities. They make it sound like so much fun. Mm-hmm. And they also make it sound accessible. Like, hey, everybody should go do this because genuinely the more the merrier. And I believe, if I remember correctly, we set up a date to be on their show. Yeah, they said something about having us on, not this weekend, but next weekend. Right. And I think we have yet to finalize that. Yeah, I haven't had any extra communications, but I think I'm more eager when it comes to scheduling and planning than other people are. So it does not surprise me. Right. Right. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if we hear from them like the day before. Yeah. And that's fine. We're, you know. It's going to be a busy weekend for me next weekend because not only am I trying to set up a recording for us to Mm -hmm. do our guest episode, but they've pretty much already reserved us for Saturday night. Well, it's their Saturday night. I think it's our Saturday afternoon. I think it's afternoon to us. Uh, If I remember correctly, they usually record at nine on Saturdays. Yeah. At night. So for us, that's like five. I think so. It's either four or five hours. I think it's five hours. It's five hours, so it's... Four? Yeah, four o'clock. So four o'clock for us. All right. That's not too bad. Yeah, then, yeah, no problem. We joked either during or after the episode. I edited the episode in five parts this week. I chunked it out into little bitty bits so I could spread myself out. But we joked about going on their show and having a little competition where we paint fake eyeballs. Oh, that's right. We did. We did do that. I should probably prepare for that because I think that's an awesome idea. I don't know if they were serious about it, but if they were, we need ping pong balls and paint. And paint. Okay. I'm pretty I'll sure put we that... already have. Pretty sure we already have brushes. Yeah, I'll put those things on the shopping list because I want to be prepared if that actually happens. Because <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that'll be a thing where if we get into the habit of painting eyeballs. We'll just paint up a bunch of eyeballs and that can be a Patreon reward. Like, hey, we're going to drop an eyeball in an envelope and send it out. (laughs) You just get a random ping pong ball in an envelope and be like, wow, this is is something. Yes, it is. 
<laughs> all right. Well, that's all fun and games, but I think it's about time that we get a little serious because a few days ago, the news came out that we have lost Yuki's burn. Our Immortan Joe, our toe cutter, has passed. He was 73 years old and he passed in a hospital. So I'm glad it was calm. Yes. I actually haven't found out, read about how he passed. Well, I tried looking up an obituary, but I wasn't able to find one. But okay. I also didn't look too hard. Yeah. It might just be private information. Yeah. Uh, I've got his, his wiki, his, sorry, his Wikipedia page open so that I have some, you know, rough outline details about his life and his work. And it doesn't say anything uh, about how he died. It just says that he died on December 1st at 73. Uh, 73 is so young. I, since working in healthcare, my sense of old and young is completely different. Mm. Completely different. You are not old until you're 90. <laughs> Anything less than 90, like, you got life ahead of you. It is too early to go. At 73 is nothing. Like, it's so young. It's so young. And such a shame. So we've been thinking a lot about him this week. Yeah. I cannot find, for the life of me, a a good, like, copy of my notes from back when we were doing season one. Because my notes were just so different. They were then. very different. My notes were all handwritten. I know that I have kept those notebooks. But we have done some packing away of our library to save space, and they have been packed away. So I do not have my notes available either from my, you know, first impressions and my first thoughts of him. I, I do specifically, very specifically remember being just so utterly delighted by his performance as Toe Cutter. He made that movie. In fact, I found a quote from George Miller just in the past couple of days. Um, these quotes are from after Hugh Keys Burns passing. Uh, George Miller said he was the glue that held the first Max mo he was the glue that held the first Mad Max movie together. At first I found him formidable to the point of being scary because he was so into the role. The truth is he he is a warm and sweet person and so embracing of everybody. I learned acting from him, probably more than anybody else I worked with. Oh. All right. I think I finally found... So we first talked about Hugh Keysburn back in minute 21 of Mad Max when he finally removes his helmet. So we discussed his top four at the time was Fury Road, Mad Max, Moby Dick, Sleeping Beauty. I think his top four has actually changed since then. It makes sense. That was like three some odd years ago where... Nope, it's the same. Oh, yeah, it is the same. Mad Max Fury Road was the last thing he'd done. Mm -hmm. with Sleeping Beauty showing up before that four years later. So I found it interesting as I went through his acting list that we have watched a lot of movies with Hugh Keysburn in them, not necessarily intentionally every time. No, there were a couple that were like, oh, he mm -hmm. was in that? Because honestly, we wanted to sit and watch a Hugh Keysburn movie <laughs> and then record about that movie and about his performance and his life. And now we were like, oh, oh, we've seen a lot of these. Like he was in for Love Alone, which we've seen. Mm -hmm. I honestly can't remember where he was in that. So where he, the green ants dream. Um, in Love Alone, he was Helen Bidet's father. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember talking about that. I still can't picture it, but I remember talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where the green ants dream. Uh, he was in The Dragon Flies or The Man from Hong Kong. Oh, or... yes. That I, I very specifically remember him. Yeah, he was fun in that one. He was fun in that one. Um, there was one. Oh, um, oh, the sports one. What's the sports one? The Blood of Heroes. Yes. Or Salute of the Jugger. Salute is the of the Jugger. Name. Do not remember him in that yeah, movie. Yeah, I don't remember the character of Lord Vile. Yeah. I don't remember. I think it's a case of we were distracted by the main characters. Oh, well, yeah. Of course. Cause... Yeah. Because it was what's-his-name. <laughs> it was their story. Yeah. Um, it was... Uh, um, he also passed. Rudger Hauer and yes. Joan Chen. Yeah. Rudger yeah. Hauer also passed this year. Mm -hmm. So we have seen so much. And okay, to be honest, we were going to watch Moby Dick. Oh. 
this afternoon after work before recording. We yeah. were going to watch Moby Dick. And then we were like, that's so long. And it's Moby Dick. It's a mini series. So each episode is an hour. Three hours. And there's three episodes. Although he only shows up in the first two. Yes. Uh, so we decided not to watch it. <laughs> it was a little much for us. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a big ask. And honestly, Moby Dick has been on our radar for a long time because it also has Bruce Spence in it. Yep. And Patrick Stewart as Ahab. Yeah, but he's not a Mad Max player. I know, but it's Patrick Stewart. I know. Anywho. <laughs> <laughs> we keep pushing it off because it's three hours of Moby Dick. <laughs> one of these day, one of these days, we are going to be in a mood where, hey, let's sit down and put on just a three-hour, ridiculously long thing, and we'll just let it run. Yes, yes, we will. I don't know when that's going to be, but it'll probably happen eventually. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. But when you consider the different roles that we've seen Hugh Keys Byrne do, I feel like we've gotten a good spread of his talents. We have. And something that strikes me about several of his roles that I've seen him in, not all of them, not for Love Alone, is that he's very charming. Yeah. For Love Alone, I, I just remember him being a bit tyrannical dad figure. Yeah, he was the dad. Yeah. In a, in a story about a young woman who wants to leave home and have a grand adventure. Yeah, he's So of dad. course he's gonna be just the biggest stick in the mud. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, he was a bit manipulative at times as oh, well, absolutely. right? And angry, a little abusive if I remember right. Those are my just vague remembrances. It's been so long. Uh, he's much more of a Immortan Joe character. <laughs> <laughs> rather than a rather than a toe cutter character. Not as bad, I'm well, sure. No, but... I mean charming versus not charming. Right. Because both of his Mad Max roles were the villain. Mm. But people love the toe cutter because again, charming is all get out. That hair, his sarcasm, his wit, it's just oh, it's so perfect. And then a Morton Joe, I don't really think there's anything likable about him. Oh, he has a great costume. Oh, People absolutely. cosplay him. Nobody cosplays the toe cutter. His costume is just whatever. But but Immortan Joe, well, now, that's a costume. Okay, so cosplaying Immortan Joe definitely offers more opportunity for craftsmanship. For sure. Toe cutter's outfit is going to be a lot more found items, distressed, and it's probably going to be a lot more subtle. So you probably have people that would love to cosplay as Toe Cutter because they love Toe Cutter. Yeah. And then they look at it and think, okay, no one's going to recognize me. Okay, you know what you need? Cutter. You know what you need? You need a group of four people to dress up as the four villains. Mm -hmm. Because Toe Cutter, you're right, is subtle. Because that's the movie that is subtle. Yeah. That's the movie that didn't have a budget. That was uh, flying by the seat of its pants a bit. Mm-hmm. If you will, but the other three are very distinctive in their outfits. Mm -hmm. So if you do the four of them together, then there you go. That would be fun. I would love to see, and this is probably something that has happened at a Wasteland weekend that we just have not seen because we've never gone. Yeah. But a toe cutter next to uh, Lord Humongous, next to Auntie, next to Immortan Joe, the four of them, I don't know, sitting around a poker table or something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Toe Cutter would absolutely cheat. Uh, well, Humongous would be an absolute rules hound. Right, right. I was about to say, well, they're all villains. So they'll probably all cheat. But just like the alignment chart in D&D, &D, just because you're a villain doesn't mean you're a certain type of villain. Mm -hmm. There are three kinds of villains. Auntie Entity strikes me as the kind of person at a poker game who would be more focused on the complimentary drinks and <laughs> Immortan Joe probably takes it way too seriously. Yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of the things I really appreciated about us watching Hugh Key's Burn movies is that after Mad Max, we stepped back and we watched Stone and got to see Hugh Key's Burn as still a biker, still, you know, a sort of bad guy because... Stone is all about a cop infiltrating a criminal gang. So he was still a bad guy on a motorcycle, but he was a different kind of bad guy on a motorcycle. He was a bit more fancy free. Yeah, he was. He was. And uh, definitely illustrates that 
there's more than one type of person in any given category. Because mm. on paper, he's the same category as the toe cutter. Uh, but in reality, he's a completely different character. Yeah. I do, or I will hold that there should have been more Hugh Keysburn in The Man from Hong Kong. Though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I loved his character. I loved that he was a cop. That he was paired up with Roger, um, oh gosh. Yeah, Roger um, Moore, right? No, wait, I mean, is Roger Moore the James Bond? Roger Ward. Roger Ward. Ward. Yeah, Roger Moore is the James Bond. Roger Ward is the Australian. Okay. See, in my head, it was the same person. Yeah, yeah, because Roger <laughs> Ward was Fifi. Big bald guy. That's right. Okay. Okay. There was a James Bond in The Man from Hong Kong, but it was not Roger Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Which just makes it infinitely more confusing. Oh no. Oh no. I'm so lost. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. This is why we have the internet open in front of us yes, yes it while is. we do this. <laughs> Aside from all of his movie credits, which we are relatively familiar with, have seen um, a couple, he was also a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh. From 1968 to 1972. Uh, so he did a whole list of Shakespeare works. As You Like It, The Balcony, King Lear, Hamlet, Much Ado About Nothing, Midsummer Night's Dream, The Tempest, the classics. Uh, some that I've never heard of, Bartholomew Fair, never heard of that, uh, The Revenger's Tragedy. And that, having that history in Shakespeare absolutely comes through. Mm. Like, even if I didn't know that from Wikipedia, I would have guessed it. Solely based on his performance from the original Mad Max. That was a Shakespeare performance. The way he carries himself yes. is so regal. Absolutely. Despite being not like dirty in some ways, but just dirt caked. Right. He's like, dusty. He lives on a beach. Yeah. He's, yeah. I would call him the leader of a poor gang. Yeah. They, they, you can tell that they steal food and gasoline and not money. Yes. <laughs> is there anything like redeemable in that that uh, they steal for their own survival not for their own profit well when you ignore the non-stealing activities that they do you know the terrorizing and the destruction right they whatnot, did murder two people um they're almost like aladdin on a motorcycle gotta st steal to or gotta eat to live gotta steal to eat that sort of situation. Tell you more about it when I got the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm certainly not going to create a redemption arc in my head. <laughs> because, again, they killed two people, gruesomely, ran them over with their motorcycles. Yes. So, there's no redemption arc there. But it doesn't mean we can't have a good time about it. Because it is just a movie. I'm a little embarrassed. You said when they killed two people... I instantly thought of the young couple in the red car, and I'm like, those people didn't die. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Jesse and Sprague. Yeah. Those count as people. <laughs> oops. Yeah, oops. <laughs> <laughs> one movie that we should definitely consider watching and one that I should definitely put on the hiatus list is a 1992 movie called Resistance. It is not only a movie that features Hugh Keysburn as an actor, but he is listed as one of the directors. Ooh. Yeah, it's a little shy of two hours long. It only has 67 ratings on IMDb, so it is a obscure movie. Mm -hmm. And even after those 67 ratings, it only has a 5.7. Ooh, so it's not necessarily a great movie. Yeah. Um, I'm. Oh, it's got Vincent Gill. Yeah, it's a... It was running down the list of actors involved. I'm like, I don't know anybody. It's a society on the verge of collapse movie. Well, that kind of sounds interesting. Yeah, it seems... Because it's... Close to our wheelhouse. It is. It's close to our wheelhouse, and it's how you get to our wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So I definitely enjoy that aspect. Yeah, certainly closer to our wheelhouse than the movie that I was considering us watching before this, Kangaroo from 1986. Yeah, you were telling me about that one, and honestly... I can't remember what it was about because I do remember it sounded boring. Yeah, it's a rated R drama. IMDb describes it this way. A mild-mannered English conscientious objector moves to what he feels will be the relative calm of Australia after World War I, 
but gets caught in the middle of violent battles between the rising trade unions and fascist groups. Oh my gosh. That sounds awful. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm still reading the cast listing for uh, Resistance, mm -hmm. and Tim Burns is in it too. Oh, look at that. Not bad for almost 20 years after filming Mad Max. Although yeah. it's probably closer to 15. I don't want to round up too much. <laughs> Heaven forbid I say something wildly inaccurate. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge cast list. A lot of, well, okay, they list the casting of people who seem to be practically extras. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if just a lot of people have like one line, so they list them or what. But this is a huge cast. Mm. Another movie that he is in that, hmm, I don't know. It's been on our radar. It's Sleeping Beauty. Oh, yeah. Not, it hasn't been on our radar for a great reason, I think. Well, it has, I don't think it's ever been on our radar to watch for hiatus stuff. No, I don't think he's in it enough to warrant that strong of a connection. Yeah. Uh, we're fans of Emily Browning. She's in that movie. She's the lead in that movie. And that's kind of what attracts us to it. Sleeping Beauty is one of those movies, according to my old notes, I mentioned it specifically because it was in his top four and i probably said it then i will say it again everything i've heard about sleeping beauty is that it is boring enough to put you to sleep really yeah oh i know there are people out there in the world who love farscape mm -hmm. and he was in farscape yeah I've he never was seen yeah i've never seen it either uh he was a character called grunt click <laughs> is that an l i don't know i'm not wearing my glasses it is an l Grunchilk. I'm sure it's like guttural because <laughs> um, I'm sure it's also an alien. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was a reoccurring character on occasion between Farscape and Farscape, the Peacekeeper Wars, which was a TV miniseries. I've never seen Farscape. Well, Farscape is one that we've definitely talked about before because oh. um, the warrior woman, Virginia Hay, is painted blue in that show. Yes. And she's like a major lead. Mm hmm And okay. not only that, one of the Vuvalini was also in that show. That's right. I remember. Melissa okay. Jaffer. There I, she is. In my head. In my head. I get mixed up between Farscape and what's the portal show? The portal show. You mean the, Stargate? Stargate. Okay. Between Farscape and Stargate. <laughs> Is it because they are kind of close together in word, word structure? Yes. So I don't know enough about Farscape. Are there portals in Farscape? I have no idea. Okay. Just don't call it Fargate or Starscape. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> the main selling point of Farscape that I can remember is that they had um, employees from the Jim Henson Creature Company come in and do a lot of the aliens. Ooh. Okay. I mean, the show only ran for four years. It's only got four seasons, so it yeah. shouldn't be that hard oh. to mainline it. Well, definitely not like, you know, Portal Show. That Stargate? Ran, thank you, Stargate, that ran for like ever and had a bazillion spinoffs. <laughs> oh, dear. So I scrolled down on the Farscape page. Uh, apparently, Farscape is also known as Space Chase. It, like in another country? In another country. Space Chase? Space Chase. Oh, my good heavens. Okay. That was the working title here in the U.S. Oh. Everywhere else. Australia, Brazil, the original title, Bulgaria. It's all Farscape. But someone in America had it as a working title for Space Chase for some reason. But yeah, everything I've heard about Hugh Keysburn as an individual was that he was magnanimous and charming. I love the behind-the-scenes clip of him in full Immortan Joe regalia, and he's lifted up the face mask, and he's shouting to the extras painted up as war boys that are on a nearby truck, and he's shouting and complimenting them about how they look amazing. Oh, that is fabulous. I oh, I love that. Um, I have something nice to close with if we're at that point, or if you want to keep talking. We've done about 28 minutes, so I think we, we're at a good spot to start wrapping it up. Okay. So I googled... Hugh Keysburn, and found this lovely little article um, on Cinema Blend. Uh, it was published. It was published today, the fourth, and it's talking about 
that's where I got the quote with George Miller. And there's a couple other quotes from George Miller. And the impetus of the article is that George Miller intends to pay tribute in some way to Hugh, Key- Hugh Key's burn in the next Furiosa movie. Okay. The character is going to be part of the movie. He is part of Furiosa's storyline. So obviously they're going to recast it. They probably would have recast the part anyways Yeah, to it, be a younger person. If they're bringing, out, bringing in Anya Taylor-Joy to play Furiosa, you're going to have to age down. Yeah, so they're probably going to replace him anyways. Uh, but but uh, George Miller has said that he intends to honor him in some way in the movie. That's nice. Yeah. I'm glad. Um, there's another direct quote from him about Hugh Keys Burns. He says his his eyes carry the power. There's no other way to do, describe it. The stature, the demeanor, and the voice. Hugh embodied all that. If he was with you right now, you would feel that natural charisma that he had. People tended to come around to him in some way. To think that presence is no longer available to the world is very sad. Yeah. So it's lovely to hear that a director who willingly chose to work with him multiple times thought so highly of him is lovely yeah you get the sense that they had a real working friendship yes and i love hearing about actors who are like down to earth and professional and take their jobs seriously but not too seriously of course um who just are the antithesis to the monsters they play yes (laughs) yes i am reminded just now when we were coming back from the Vuvulini, racing to the Citadel, past Immortan Joe, I think it was the Monsters at Rest scene, mm-hmm. when we got to see Immortan Joe's mace up close, and I pulled up a video that an auction house put together because they were auctioning off that mace, and it was Hugh Keys Burn sitting, and he was talking about the mace and how he got to put a lot of it together, and so he was pointing out what all of you know, this metal means this, and I put this here because I like it, and how he was able to work with the props department to put care into an element of his costume. And I really liked that. And I think he's going to, his his absence will be felt going forward in the series. Certainly, it will be felt. And I think that's all you can really say about that. Yeah, that he will be missed. Yeah. So join us next week we will be back with more patreon content for you our lovely patrons bye bye stick to you like a tire on a